Hey, are you hiring? If you answered yes, let Zentegra Staffing help staff your IT people needs. Head over to Zentegra.com forward slash Zentegra Staffing to find out more. Zentegra Staffing, we can staff your IT people needs. Welcome to another edition of the Citrix Session with your hosts, Andy Whiteside and Bill Sutton, your source for all things Citrix. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 62 of the Citrix Session. I'm your host, Andy Whiteside. I've got some of my normal crew with me, Bill Sutton, Director of Services as Integra. Bill, how's it going? Going fine, Andy. Thank you. And I thought you'd be obviously a good co-host all the time, but uh, based on your knowledge of Citrix um, virtual app and desktop features that uh, may have new names, but a lot of them have been around for a long time and very valuable um, pieces of the equation. I thought you'd be a great person to help us kind of navigate through uh, our topic for today, which is quite extensive. It is extensive, Uh, you're right. In addition to that, uh, we have Pete Downey, who is a CMTO, but in this case today, well, maybe playing a little bit of both roles, a CTO really to help us understand these different uh, features uh, that each of the different additions, and I'm going to be very specific to call it additions, not versions, but additions of the Citrix uh, services and what they bring to the table. How's it going, Pete? Uh, it's going well, man. Can't complain, Andy. Having a good Monday so far. That's part of it. And, and I referenced this to you guys. I just, I'm just coming back off vacation. Um, three or four days of uh, living life a little harder than normal. I'm, I'm probably three or four days back to get back to normal. But I'm excited about doing this podcast because this is a, a topic that I think a lot of people uh, need to know about. Uh, I think it's a topic that uh, is often confused by customers who are struggling with Citrix technologies, not the technology itself. It's, it is by far the best technology on the market for end user virtualization compute. Um, where they struggle most often is around total cost of ownership. And, and as you two guys know, I've, I've started another little company that's uh, trying to make hyperconverged affordable to people, uh, whether or Nutanix or something else that we're working with. Uh, and at the same time, we hear all the time that the Citrix products are just too expensive. Uh, and a lot of times if we, if we truly know what's going on, we can kind of boil it down to what the customer's needs versus, you know, buying the, buying the uh, top of the line Lexus on the lot. I, I compare it to um, somebody who walks onto a, a, you know, maybe a car lot in there and, and they're shown the Lexus, but they don't need the Lexus. They really need a, a Camry. And uh, what I hope today is to help people understand that Citrix is not expensive and, and hasn't been. Uh, it's been affordable for a very long time. You just got to approach it the right way. So I will try to help us here with the um, talking through the visual. Our our product matrix, which we got off the Citrix website, is called Citrix Virtualization Services, and I underline the word services, product feature matrix. Uh, and it looks like there must be about uh, about 100 maybe uh, different features that we're going to go through here. Uh, this, this does not include... Citrix um, service provider ways of attacking this. And Pete, I don't know if you know, uh, if you're able to talk through that enough at this point, I know we got a podcast or a webinar coming up uh, later this week to talk about it. Uh, but Citrix uh, service provider either, well, in this case, we're talking about cloud services. So Citrix service provider for Citrix cloud virtual app and desktop services. Um, that's one that's not covered here, but it's, it's essentially similar to one of these products. Do you know which one? Um. Uh, yeah, I think the, well, I know Trevor, I think Trevor, you're on, right, buddy? And, uh, and the, uh, yeah, I think the licensing is a lot different from from a back end, but you can pretty much consume these through CSP. It's just, it's how they're priced to us. So, so Trevor, you can see my screen here where I've got all the different products, like the, the subscription products. Um, you run our Citrix service provider practice. Do those... Do, do those break down into individual additions as well, or is there just one addition that a service provider license can allow customers to subscribe to? So they line up pretty well. Um, there, there are differences um, to them, but there's standard, there's premium, um, both desktop, desktop only um, apps and desktop. So it's, yeah, it, in the past, it's been, there was a lot more differences. They've done a pretty good job at aligning those um, now, especially for the cloud, the cloud side. But you can, mm-hmm. whether it's on-prem or cloud, you can, you know, they have CSP licensing for it. So, Trevor, is it 
fair to say that the decision to go CSP is really a business decision, um, Citrix service provider, to get these services where you as a customer are looking for a minimal monthly commit that you may go over, but you're at least going to hit the minimal commit uh, and willing to pay an extra price to have that flexibility month to month. Is that usually where these conversations start? Yeah, it's kind of either two ways, right? It, it's a service provider license, in, as the name says. And so the service provider is like typically bundling um, other services around it or a solution around it, you know, like we do, um, and selling it as a, you know, a, a bundle SKU essentially to the end user. It's kind of the easy button. Um, then you have the option where the customer just needs a licensing model that is that meets their need, right? It, but like you mentioned flexibility, right? So if I've, I'm in a seasonal business and I spike during, you know, their, whatever that peak season is for them, Christmas or whatever, and they need an extra thousand or 2000 licenses, you know, it, it's, a, it's a perfect fit. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a good example uh, of where you can have a conversation here is like higher education, where they have their ebbs and flows based on the semesters. Uh, and, and in most cases, what I've seen is the subscription model, uh, the price is more com uh, compelling enough so that in June and July, maybe August, when they don't have kids there, uh, if they factor those months in, they, uh, they still end up better off in the subscription model versus the service provider script subscription model. Uh, but it's each business, right? Like you mentioned retail, that, that might be a great example where they blow it out of the water every December, uh, but the other 11 months of the year, they're twiddling their thumbs in terms of their consumption. Yeah. And, and we definitely have to note that these are the service provider licenses requires that um, that the service provider actually is doing a level of management or support with it. So there's some well, restrictions around that. Let's do let's let's clarify that as much as we can here without going too deep. It it really means that the managed service provider is really managing the Citrix environment or to a large degree managing it. Um, and in that case, the customers, you know, allowing that to happen. Therefore, the service provider license is in play. Yep, that's exactly right. Okay. Uh, Trevor, um, you see on the screen here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six additions to talk through. How many additions are there in the service provider, Citrix service provider world? Let's see, um, it's okay if you need to look it up and come back to us. Yeah, I, I think we're, we we can cover all, we cover all these, mm -hmm. so all, all six of these. Let me, let me pull it up and just verify that there's not, um, and, and while you're looking at that, can you give us just a, a ballpark on the pricing of the different options per month? Uh, yeah. Just a general pricing. And, and what I would say here, too, is um, make sure that the customers know that a partner like Zintegra and other Citrix partners, we're going to expect a, a minimal commit, but we're going to expect a, a minimal time, too. Right? We're looking at one-year commitments, even though you can go up and down month to month. Uh, we're still looking for a minimal commit over a period of time in order to get in one of these agreements, right? Yeah, kind of the the uniqueness comes. They have what in the when we're talking specifically cloud CSP. Um, there is a commit um, SKU, and then there's the uh, essentially a flex SKU. So if you want com completely month to month, um, that, that you would you would get the flex SKU. And if you want you want the better pricing, and you know you you're gonna you're definitely you're you're gonna have let's just say 500 um, users that are gonna be consistent across the year. You would want to go ahead and get the commit SKU for for the year, which would give you the lower price, and then you could then you would leverage the flex SKU beyond that. And and by default, the flex SKU would come in, and if if you committed to 500 and one month you went to 600, you would just automatically go to the flex SKU. You get invoice for the flex SKU um, price. So that's that's kind of how they, and, that, and that's different. The Citrix, um, the CSP with Citrix Cloud, that, that is unique to, uh, to the cloud offering. Mm -hmm. It's a little different, okay. like all because because the on-prem CSP is is all all flex. It's just mm -hmm. they're just one SKU. So that I just wanted to call that uniqueness yeah. out. Yeah. So the customers just need to know that there are options that include a, a, a monthly option, and that's the main CSP driver. Um, okay. So let's uh, let's start the conversation by making sure people understand that in all things Citrix these days, virtual app and desktop 
uh, for sure. Everything is a subscription, um, either a one year, two years, three years, five years, uh, or the monthly type subscription we've been talking about. Uh, but everything's a subscription. The real uh, differentiation here is whether we're talking about an on-premises subscription, which on-premises, by the way, could mean you know put it in your own um, IaaS solution in a public cloud or a cloud. Uh, that's that's on-premises, as crazy as that sounds. Um, but what we're really talking about here today is the, where Citrix manages the control plane, which is what really constitutes Citrix virtual desktop services, Citrix virtual apps and desktop services. It's the control plane, and that's that's really top of mind to me today. today. I got a call later to explain to a customer that uh, Citrix managed desktop isn't actually managed by Citrix. It's just hosted. Uh, but I told the control plane that we're talking about here, um, unless we're talking about Citrix managed desktops. In that case, it's it's the desktops hosted by Citrix, but they still don't manage it. You still have to have either internal management or someone like us. But um, so just to run through these, uh, and then we're going to go down through the features. We've got Citrix virtual desktop service, which is user uh, device pricing. And I, I think Bill and I have covered user device in the past where it does both simultaneously and figures out the lowest algorithm that uses the least amount of licenses. Uh, it's only user device and uh, around a list price of $160. So $160 for a one year subscription. Let me make sure I'm reading that right. Um, $160 for a one year subscription. And, and I just want to pause here. Anybody who ever tells me that they're trying to do a virtual desktop rollout with Citrix and it's too expensive, they just don't know that they've got options. This is for, for what you get with this, it's a really cost effective way to roll out virtual desktops and use by far the best product on the market to do it. Um, and that's, if nothing else from this podcast, I just want to make people, make sure people are aware that Citrix is not expensive, hasn't been expensive for a very long time. If you only need the basics around VDI, which a lot of customers just need that. So um, let, let me run through these and I'll let uh, Pete and Bill comment, but number one addition, Citrix virtual desktop service, that's just VDI, uh, Citrix virtual apps and desktop standard service uh, that allows you to publish apps and present apps as well as desktops that includes server-based desktops. So if I go back to the previous one, uh, you can't do server desktops, multi-session desktops. You can't even do uh, Windows 10 multi-session, which I don't, um, you can't do any multi-session uh, in the very first one. Uh, so it is limiting for sure. Uh, but you do get the power of the, the, the beautiful protocol from Citrix, which is the number one thing that differentiates it from everybody else. Uh, virtual apps advanced service. I, that's just apps. I don't know if you can even do desktops. Um, uh, we'll come back through the features here in a minute. Uh, Citrix virtual app premium service. Again, I'm, that's just apps. I don't know what's included there. We've got about 100 items we're going to talk through. Uh, Citrix virtual apps and desktop advanced service. And then Citrix virtual app and desktop premium service. Let me, let me run through the numbers again real quick on that. So uh, the first one is um, user device only. It's $160 annually. Uh, the second one is uh, the... Um, I'm sorry, the first one is not even on the list, Citrix Managed Desktop. And that's what I was alluding to a while ago where Citrix actually uses their tenant or your tenant to host and the control plane and the desktop workloads. That's the 160 a month. Um, the actual Citrix um, virtual desktop service is 220 a month, excuse me, 220 a year. If I've screwed that up on the last one, I'm sorry. It's 160 a year, 220 a year, user only. Um, Citrix virtual app and desktop standard service is 160 um, for the user device or 350 for the concurrent uh, use case. Um, Citrix virtual app uh, advanced service is $145 annually for the service uh, user device and 220 for concurrent. Uh, Citrix virtual apps premium is uh, 220 for user device and 485 for concurrent. Uh, Citrix virtual apps desktop advanced service is 200 per user device or 440 for concurrent users. Uh, we can do a whole podcast on user device versus concurrent. Uh, and then finally, virtual apps and desktop premium service is uh, $300 user device for the year or 800 and uh, 660, my eyesight's going bad, uh, concurrent um, for the year. So we're, we're gonna jump into the features here in a minute, but, but um, Pete, that's a lot. And I tried to cover it verbally. Um, my main point here is Citrix has options. Yep. If you think it's too expensive, go find the option that fits most of your needs and figure out what you can live with and live without. And then let's talk about it. You have some comments on all that? Yeah, and I, I think the, the key here, right, is, you know, customers need to know that, you know, one, they have options and two, uh, Citrix has added a lot of flexibility now to their, their services stack, if you will. Um, you know, especially with the new advanced uh, offering, which I would argue, and Bill, keep me honest here, uh, is is essentially the mirror of what they have on premises today. I mean, yeah, there's some 
key features that are above and beyond advanced edition, but a lot of customers, you know, I think are, are happy with, you know, what they have on prem and want to mirror what they have could have up in the, in the cloud service. So, you know, I think the advanced is always a good launch point for a customer to consider. And, you know, just to put it into kind of a simple or, you know, term, it, you know, it comes down to per user per month pricing. So you, you're looking at $16 per user per month, you know, pricing, you know, on average, right. Uh, again, these are MSRP pricing, right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that, that, that makes it very affordable. And if you look at concurrency, you know, the whole notion of a concurrent license is, is that it's, you know, fits in the shift. So like healthcare, for example, a nurse's station, you might have three shifts. So you're paying, you know, $36 per concurrent, you know, license per month. Right. But you really look at that, you're getting that across three shifts. So you're now down mm-hmm. to $12 per user on average. Right. So, so that's, you know, if you look at it that way, yeah, it becomes very affordable for the customer. So let's not go too far down that path, Pete, but my general rule of thumb is if you've got two thirds of your organization working more than two shifts, it probably makes sense to look at concurrent. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree with that. Yep. Bill, any uh, additional comments before we move into the madness of covering all the different features here? No, I think you'll hit it when you cover the features, but I would agree with Pete as it relates to the virtual apps advanced service. Um, You know, one of the, one of the things we'll see as you go through this is it says virtual apps, but it does allow you to publish a a hosted desktop, which you'll touch Mm -hmm. on in a minute. Um, So it just is limited to a server OS versus or a server like OS, which you'll get to in a minute. Well, and, and so let's just hit that real quick. And I, I said it a minute ago, I'll, I'll reiterate here. It's not easy to understand. Um, it's it's multi-session. Like the, the apps, part of the app service is what allows for multi-session, whether it's the desktop or whether it's the apps. The, app. the, right. the Citrix virtual desktop server is just for single session Windows 10 at this point. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, Trevor, um, we'll give you a chance to speak here before we jump in. I think the very first one is going to be going to be your your conversation. I don't really understand how they're proposing that in this document, but the first line item is Citrix monthly subscription. Um, is that CSP? Um, hey, before we hit that, I just want to call out because I kind of made a misstatement. So CSP does not cover the advanced version um, for cloud. So, um, but they, and they also have something that's unique. That's um, it's called sing, single app. So it's basically Citrix Virtual Apps Premium Service, but it's it's, it's for a it's really for service providers that have a you know that they're actually leveraging it to SaaSify their their uh, legacy application um, for for their mm-hmm. customer base. So that that's another you know another option that's out there. But Which, okay, that- so. Well, hold on. Before you go there, I, I do want to highlight something. There's there's a whole world of Citrix these days that's wrapped around the desktop. Uh, we talk about Microsoft WBD and how that's desktop only, multi-session Windows 10 potentially. The world of taking one strategic application that might even be a legacy application and piping that to a majority of your users via Citrix is still one one hell of a use case. And I see a lot of customers just get hung up on the desktop and the desktop's great. And and that's what we do as Integra. We give everybody a desktop. I love that concept. But if you need Citrix and some of the features that come with one of these additions in here, just to publish an application and it solves a massive problem for your organization. I mean, don't be ashamed of that. That's still a really, really good use case. Yeah, no, I I agree for sure. There's, There's whole businesses built off of that. No, we we do quick. Yeah, books, I, right? I think I think I think one one thing that we see all the time is is that um, you know you, you've got a lot of customers that have Windows endpoints, right? So they're 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 going through the the workflow for an end user having to log into a desktop to then click on a icon for a desktop and having to and maybe having to go back and forth, right? So. Mm-hmm. And and really, so the, the published app for some of those some of those customers that really aren't going really full desktop, you know, or, or aren't really fully committed to it, that the published application really is a is a great great option to just publish those apps out to that endpoint and have a more seamless workflow for their users. So I'm I'm a I'm a big fan of that just just for the pure end user experience of it. 
you know, Trevor, I just realized that you jumped on, I think, late. Uh, Trevor runs our our managed services practice. I don't know. I did a good job explaining that, but that's that's the voice of Trevor that you're hearing there. I'm not sure if I thought about it. Trevor, we just got off a ski trip. You and I were gone for four days, five days, and the guy that was with us was launching a Cisco AnyConnect connection from the condo painfully uh, just so we could go in and run one legacy app that in most cases, if the latency was anything above uh, um, uh, you know, high speed, he, it wouldn't even work. And, and you had to get him on your Verizon just so he could run his, uh, I'll be uh, derogatory here, stupid VPN and connect to some old legacy app. Um, we had an answer for him, right? Could have. Yeah, it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's where Citrix got started, really. That, that use case right there, all these applications were never designed to run on WAN, right? So yeah. that was, it, we saw it. You know, and, and, and but they're still, but the, the problem is the applic- the bandwidth has increased, but the applications are still out there. And then you get into, mm-hmm. you know, a situation where you don't have the bandwidth. Yeah. Yep. So, so here's my message to the folks listening. If you think Citrix is too expensive and you think the network is an issue, you should have been around in 1999 when we were paying for it for concurrent licensing at the max price with no options, uh, more or less. And we were doing over dial up connection. When somebody says it won't work or can't work or it's too expensive, I just have to write it off as you just don't know what you're talking about because it, it will it will work and it can be cost effective if you do your research. And, and that's total cost of ownership. I talk to people all the time that, um, you know, they, they can't tell me how much they're currently paying to, to buy and deploy and manage a PC. So they really don't know what they're comparing apples, apples and apples to. They're, they're really comparing apples to oranges and, and saying that it's too expensive. Okay. Um, so Trevor, that first one, do you, Citrix monthly subscription, why is that line there and what's it alluding to? And why is it only associated with the Citrix virtual app and desktop standard service? Yeah, that's a great question. I I I, I would like an answer to that. Um, I think <laughs> they're we're, we're, they they're in the process right now of making a lot of changes as it relates to how CSP integrates into um, the traditional licensing model. So I, I I think that is a brand new one that I am just not familiar with, and and I think we're I think this is this must have just come out in the last few weeks. It did. Yeah, it's new. It's it's new. And, and look, guys, if you're listening to this and you're concerned or want to know some of these information, you literally have to look every quarter because things show up on this feature matrix that weren't there the quarter before. Go ahead, Pete. Yeah, this is uh, – so if you guys remember um, – CMD, Citrix Managed Desktop. So that was the desktop as a service offering. Mm-hmm. Um, so what this is, is you can get what's called Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktop Standard, uh, either monthly, uh, yearly, or concurrently. Um, now, um, you know, UD, et cetera. But what that is, is that's the uh, Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktop Standard service for Azure. So uh, you, can, you, can, you can bring your own Azure or you can or you can pay Citrix, uh, you know, for everything, you know, licensing, uh, consumption, et cetera. So it's their desktop as a service offering. So Pete, this is, this is Citrix managed desktop blended with virtual app and desktop service. And you just have the ability to plug it into your Azure tenant or Citrix's Azure tenant to make it easier. Right. Yeah, correct. So, so, you know, CMD, I always jokingly say was the, is the best control plane for, for WVD for windows virtual Mm -hmm. desktop. And, and they just rebranded it as Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktop Service uh, Standard Service, and then they add the for Azure if you're going to do full on end to end, pay Citrix for everything. So, mm-hmm. and and that's really good. I brought it up a minute ago, but I'll hit it again. I mean, the, this world's different now with Microsoft getting into the basics of VDI play with their managed desktop solution. Uh, it's important that if you're kicking the Microsoft tires, that you also understand what your options are on the Citrix side and you don't, just don't get fed up with the cost of Citrix and, and abandon it, you know, cut off your nose to spite your face kind of thing. Okay, great. Um, all right, next one, uh, yearly subscription. They're all there. Uh, one year, two years, three years, five years. That's the options we normally see our customer going with, right, guys? All in favor, say aye. Yeah, yeah. That's typically, you know, when a customer goes into a, a mul- you know, a, a yearly subscription model, they, they either will go one, three, or five, typically. Um, and you know, obviously, the longer you're willing to commit, the your better your discounting power, et cetera. So, uh, and then the bigger you are, obviously, puts you in the you know different tiers for discounting. But 
yearly is usually the way to go as far as, you know, as far as negotiating power. But if you're a smaller business, then, you know, monthly is nice because you can go month to month, add licenses as you go. Um, and it becomes a more affordable option uh, for a smaller business. And, you know, arguably CSP can also become a f- affordable option as well. So, yeah. All right, so the next one talks about concurrent licensing. From what I covered earlier, it's really only the Citrix virtual desktop service that doesn't come in a, in a concurrent license option, the managed desktop as, as well. Um, we're a little late doing this podcast. And before everything was a subscription, you literally could get uh, the on-premises version of Citrix for just the desktop, just VDI for $99 a user. I, I struggled when people said it was too expensive, but now it's uh, 220 for the, uh, the service. Um, but that's the only one that doesn't come in a concurrent option is the, uh, the Citrix virtual desktop service. So we'll move on to the next one. They all come in a user device. That's uh, Pete, you want to go into why user device makes a lot of sense in a lot of cases where people are being strategic with the, with the solution? You there? I, th- I think it, uh, I think it comes down to, um, you know, to your point, if, you know, a certain, if a certain percentage of your staff is, is shift based then okay, maybe it makes sense to go concurrent, but I, I encourage our, our listeners, listeners to do the math as well, because you have, you know, obviously with more numbers, you get better buying power and with better buying power, you hopefully get better discounting. But from a UD perspective, it's going to come down to uh, feature and functionality because not all the products in the stack are concurrently available. So for example, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, you, um, uh, I can't brain fart and bill, uh, the mobile device management uh, offering like MAM and MDM, that's only, that's only available as UD licensing. Right. Uh, you know, I know secure browsing, I believe is only available in UD mm-hmm. licensing. So, so, you know, it, it, I think it empowers the customer to get better buying power. Cause you know, if you have 3000 users and you go to the table and you say, Hey Citrix, we're going to have 3000 users versus cut it down to maybe 500 users. Cause you're going to be, you want to go concurrent. Yeah. On, on the surface, you might be saving more money just because you're paying less, but longer term from a, from a negotiation power, you're, you're, you might be paying more, right? So if you have to add licenses down the road. So I, I always encourage my, my customer base to look at UD alongside of their concurrent strategy if they think they really need to go concurrent because sometimes Citrix can help you make it up in other areas, right? So there's, there's a couple of points there. One, if, you, if you're doing this for real and strategically and you don't have that, that corner case shift work like nurses or other manufacturing, then it almost always makes sense to go user device, you know, negotiate, get the best price you can on user device. But then the key, and this is where Citrix wants you to go, is Integra wants you to go and where you should want yourself to go is if you buy a thousand user device licenses as a, as a service, a three year subscription, you got to go use them. Cause if it just sits there on the shelf and you're paying for three years worth of a service, uh, it's kind of like that um, planet fitness membership Trevor has, uh, uh, you're, you just, you're wasting your money. You might as well not even spend the $10 a month. Sorry, Trevor. That's right. Hey, uh, you guys, you guys have been around long enough. You, you remember when Citrix uh, got rid of the uh, concurrent there for a second? Oh, yeah. Whew. You remember oh, yeah. the just uh, backlash? Yeah. Well, you know, the, the reasoning behind that was Microsoft doesn't, you know, didn't have, con- didn't, didn't use concurrent. And so they were aligning with Microsoft. And I think that, I think that made a lot of sense, but the reality was is that Citrix was built, you know, the use cases had been built on concurrency and it, it uh, yeah. Well, I think pre, that, uh, pre-VDI, pre-VDI, people just didn't see it as strategic enough to suck up going from concurrent to user device. I think over time it, it, it has kind of happened, uh, but mandating it did not go very well. No. Yeah. Bill, I'm, I, we won't go into it now, but I'm sure you've got it. I, I will tell you this. Um, most of the customers that complain the most, if they really stopped and looked at it, they really didn't have anything to complain about. They would have been better off using the product strategically and user device made more sense because of the algorithm and the way it you know, checks out a license by device. If user makes more sense, it'll convert to license. Citrix really deserves a lot of accolades for the way they implemented that, not just going straight on user device. Yeah, I'd agree with that. All right, uh, 24 by seven support, I guess, uh, yes, you get 24 by seven support option and all of these. I don't know that it's always an entitlement. I think you have to pay extra for those. Trevor can probably tell me. I will say that Zintegra does provide 24 by seven Citrix support, if that's something you guys are looking at. And, and one of the nice things about that is you get to know our team, they get to know you and you don't get that, uh, 
did you turn it on question every time or, you know, are the lights blinking kind of thing? Uh, Trevor, 24 by seven support here. Is that, uh, is that accurate? Or I thought it was uh, business yeah. only support by default. Yeah. Select, select, you know, select is included, which does include that there are some, some limitations around that. So it has to be a, a SEV, you know, SEV one, um, to, to be 24 by seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a situation a couple weeks ago where a customer was trying to do an upgrade over the weekend, and it wasn't uh, totally SEV1, and so they, they told him to call back on Monday. Not, not real happy at that point in time. Um, yeah. All right. So, <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, Thanks, no, I was just going to say, I mean, and, and so we, you know, there's, Zentegra provides additional, what I call kind of more white-labeled um, support where we, we'll come in and do a – do an assessment and, you know, get to know your environment. So when you do call in, it's, you're, you're talking to the same group of people and they, they, they have your environment document and they probably, you've already probably worked with them. So it, it really, really helps. And we, and we, and on the back end, we, we can coordinate with Citrix if it's something that they need to be involved with as well. So. Yeah. If we need to escalate, or if you tell us, Hey, I, Matt on the Zintegra team, I don't really like that guy. We'll give you another one. Um, just extremely powerful and flexible. And, you know, if you're using this strategically, you need that. And yeah, that's why we built the team out the way we have. Um, next section here talks about the uh, deliver windows apps. And I'm going to, I'm going to change what that says. That is the ability to present through application, virtualization, presentation, at the presentation layer of the OSI model, uh, an application seamlessly without the rest of the desktop, whether that user is down the hall from the data center or 10,000 miles away, all you see is a seamless application on your screen. I was, I was very specific with the way I said that because it drives me nuts to hear people tell me that that's streaming, that is not streaming, that is presenting the application. Uh, who, wants to, who wants to comment on that one? Bill, I'll let you go, you've, you've been quiet. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, they, they always use the word, the term deliver windows app and, and to your point, streaming is, is a term that's used a lot, but it, it's really around delivering the app in the same, with the same you look and feel that you would as if it were local, even though it's running somewhere else. The, the only technical challenge of that is sometimes windows pop up behind windows and without that entire desktop, you're going to get calls every once in a while. People can't find the window that just happens to be behind the other one. That's the one bugaboo that, that makes yeah, me lean towards desktops. Bugaboo. Yeah, the other bugaboo, so to speak, is where you've got an app that's linked to another app that might not be in that environment. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the time when we're doing projects, we will ask that question. You know, if you're if you're leveraging a vertical market business app that links to Outlook, we need to make sure that Outlook is on that server as well so that the two don't conflict or the two don't the two can work together. Yeah. Properly. Not 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 only that, it's got to be configured properly, which is a whole another ball of wax. And now you're talking about you know caching, um, streaming the uh, the cache file so that uh, you know it works well. Right. Um, so this one and the next one, maybe the next two, are the two that really kind of rule out the first option, the Citrix virtual desktop service, if you're looking for these things. Uh, the next one is multi-session Windows 10, which is a big part of the value add of, um, of Microsoft WBD, WBD with Citrix in addition to it. Um, Pete, you want to take that one? Yeah, so the, uh, this is a you know, great functionality. You know, so um, basically what this means is if you're using – uh, the service. Uh, so, so any of the services up here that where this is available, uh, you get not only access to Windows 10 multi-session desktops, but you also get what's called Linux-based pricing. So your your pricing uh, per per session is a, a lot less than it would be if you just went and paid for. Uh, Windows 10 multi-session standalone, um, and, and and because Citrix is part of what's called the Lighthouse program with WVD, uh, they're able to be a quote-unquote control plane uh, for for WVD as well as a presentation layer for the for the uh, end user. So mm -hmm. I, AKA HDX ICA, which we'll probably talk about in a little bit. But uh, the value add here is obviously better economies of scale. So Win 10 multi-session gives you that multi-session scenario, but with the desktop look and feel, and, and then also lower cost per user per month. And, and that's really important when we start talking about running workloads in a public cloud where the meter can be very, uh, can be very expensive to do so if you're not really being efficient as possible. And part of that is at least getting two users per Windows 10 session. There's even a, a footnote here that we should cover that you know, we mentioned it, but uh, Microsoft uh, Windows Virtual Desktop entitlement is required to run multi-session Windows. And that's the only place on the planet you're allowed to do it. 
Yep, and that I think uh, the compute. I, I think uh, it might be a little compute. I think that's a little confusing to me, but I, I think when I say Windows Virtual Desktop, because um, there's entitlements, right? So you can use those entitlements in different ways. But what what they're saying is, you obviously you have to be in Azure. You have to be hosting in Azure to get the multi multi session. Which is a whole other topic, how Microsoft can legitimately do that in their environment and everybody else's. That, to me, sounds like a little bit of a, of a um, legal challenge somewhere down the road, but yeah, we'll see. Bill, you got a comment? Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say that one of the things about – that Trevor touched on it, but that Windows 10 multi-session uh, requires an Azure, uh, an Azure delivery. Mm -hmm. Um, so the next one here is uh, deliver multi-session Windows Server Desktop. And this goes back to like a lot of our you know legacy use cases for us, whether it was an app or a desktop, where we try to get – Bill, what would you say normally um, is a good target for the number of users per running operating system, server operating system? Probably 20, 30, somewhere around there. I mean, there have been, there've been uh, statements made in the past where you could get 100 <laughs> per server, but I think 20 to 30 is where we typically land, sometimes less depending on the apps. Yeah. Well, let, let's say you get 30. What if one person screws something up? What happens to number 29 through one? Depends on how bad they screw it up. If they blue screen the server, then, then the users go south. They go away and have to connect to another server. <laughs> That's that's one of the the bigger downsides of the multi session piece. Plus, you got to have a lot of knowledge to set that up. Um, you got to know your applications really well. Uh, but what we're highlighting here is uh, the Citrix desktop service is the only one that doesn't allow you to do a uh, multi session server operating system, uh, aka desktop or applications. I, I will tell you that one of the founding principles of Zintegra was you don't have to do VDI uh, to do desktops, and I still stand by that. We have a team that's got many, many years of uh, making server desktops work well. Uh, at the same time, if it's a uh, if it's a square peg, don't try to shove it in a round hole. The uh, the cost of doing VDI has come down a lot with hyperconverge and other things. So it's really just a conversation of you know what subset of users do you want to do with a server desktop, and what subset do you want to do with a single session or multi session Windows 10. Yeah, and the other thing about this is obviously when you're dealing with Windows Server desktops, those can run on premises or they can run in in a cloud-based environment. Right. So I find this next one interesting. It's, it says deliver single session server OS desktop, cold, dedicated personal. This is a server VDI, right? Let's talk about. Right. Yep. This is uh, essentially taking a server OS, and I think Pete was going to jump in there, but taking a server OS and treating it as if it were a you know a, a desktop OS in the sense that one user per server. Uh, it was a way of getting around, I think, some of the VDA licensing um, because you would need a remote desktop services Cal in this instance, uh, but there were some other benefits Pete might be able to speak to that as to why um, why that would be the case. But that's essentially what it is, is using a server OS like a desktop OS, one user to one OS. Yeah, and I, I, and I don't, yeah, I'm trying to think about the other benefits, but I think the, the biggest benefit is you might, you know, if, you, if you're on premises and you're doing like a blade compute scenario, um, you know, where, where you might have a little bit more RAM needs than the, uh, than a desktop OS. But, um, yeah, I would say this use case is very niche to potentially like financial environments, uh, potentially healthcare where graphics intensive, uh, you know, scenarios where, uh, a single, you know, application could take down a whole session based compute scenario or in finance, the, the, the telltale, you know, Excel spreadsheet that has a memory leak and it takes down the whole server. <laughs> you know? So, so let me throw a couple at you guys. One would be what Bill mentioned earlier, the, the cost of the Microsoft virtual desktop access license, not to be confused with Citrix Ver delivery agent license, uh, right. but the Microsoft BDA license. What about um, the concept that a Windows server OS doesn't come with a bunch of garbage pre-installed? I, I think that's lesser on Windows 10 now, but at one point you got all kinds of garbage when you try to go VDI. That, that's part of the conversation too. Like the, the, the limited amount of optimizations is, is much better on the server side at least historically has been. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, that certainly could be a, a reason for for going this direction, but probably not the only reason. So, Bill, here's, here's one along that same line. And for Pete, too, what's, what's the difference between the Windows 10 kernel and the server 2019 kernel? Not enough that you even know, right? Yeah, not a, not a whole lot. Just really the, Not just a whole the, lot, yeah, exactly. The Microsoft's the, not writing a new kernel for both operating systems. They're using the same one. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Pete. 
I was going to say just the only difference is the user experience. That's it. The, how the user interacts with the, uh, the workspace, if you will. <laughs> so here's one more for you. Of course, Microsoft uh, lets you run Windows 10 in their public cloud. What about Amazon and Google? I mean, we, we're stuck on server OS over there, aren't we? Yeah, for right now, because, you know, Win 10 is Win 10 multi-session is going to be exclusive to WVD and Azure. So, so you can you can run Windows 10, I think, in AWS. Pete, tell me if I'm wrong. You just have to bring your own licenses at the very least, right? Yep, that's how I understand it. And, um, yeah, I'll double check that for our listeners. But that's how I understand it today. It's still the case. Yeah. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing for a corporate desktop. You wouldn't want that for your personal, you know, PC. But for a corporate desktop where you run the Microsoft suite and two or three other uh, business-related applications, works perfectly fine. Now, now that's that's one topic. The other kind of flip side of that is, and I think we may get into this, this in a second. It could be that your application vendor just won't support their app on a on a server operating system, and even though it works fine, you're kind of in this hairy this hairy area, right? Yeah, exactly. yeah, that'll that'll drive you toward back to the OS, the uh, the client OS or the Windows 10 type of environment, and and that's probably not as common now as it used to be. But that boy, there were times in the past where I wish we had the the desktop OS option um, because it, some apps just flat out wouldn't run in multi-user mode on a um, server OS. And, and Bill, you're really calling out two things. You're you're calling out multi-session, which is a potential problem. You're also calling out an application that was written poorly and doesn't really understand Windows, and it's hard coded into things that don't exist on the server OS. Exactly, you're right. Or or just some bonehead that um, answers the phone and realizes you got a server OS and tells you to go away, right. uh, and you have to go reproduce it. Okay, um, the next, uh, and guys, I don't know how much time you guys have. I, I, I've got more time, but just keep me posted maybe in the chat window. We may have to do a part two on this. But uh, uh, deliver single session Windows client OS desktops. Those can be pooled, dedicated, personal. Uh, it looks like option one, which, again, is a good option if you're just trying to VDI. Uh, option two, which is virtual app and desktop standard service. And then options uh, five and six here where it's uh, Citrix virtual apps apps and desktop advanced service and premium service. Uh, this, this is just essentially single session Windows 10, right, guys, VDI? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. <clears throat> and then um, which, uh, I don't know if we highlighted this enough, I assume we have, but that's, that's a great use case. And, and if you look at the math correctly, that pays for itself. If you can get the total cost of ownership of how you currently do it, and then factor that against the operational efficiency and the enablement around security and performance that come along with that work from anywhere. We've got a pandemic going on right now. That It truly does make sense, but you really have to understand what your value you're getting. You can't just look at it as my $500 PC versus you know, $2,000 a year to have a virtual desktop, which that may be high, but you can't just look at the cost of the PC versus what you're trying to roll out. If you do, you're, gonna, you're never going to justify it. Uh, next one is a very exciting topic, uh, deliver Linux apps. So we're talking about seamlessly presenting Linux applications. Uh, I think I've run into that twice in my career. Bill, thoughts on that one? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've run into it a couple of times as well, but not any more than that, just like you. Um, and, and the one right after that um, plays right into the very similar thing. And uh, it works really well. Uh, it is, it's a little involved to set it up, but, um, but it, works, it works really well for customers that need it. And, you know, and ideally, that's that one Linux application that's strategic for the company and, you know, might be 50 users, might be 50,000 that need it. Um, and Citrix making that an option has been just a, a really powerful thing for those organizations. Yes, absolutely. So just a quick um, note here, because you guys have a hard stop, we'll, we'll do a part two of this and we'll cover what we can here and then we'll, we'll wrap it up and follow, follow up with a part two. Um, deliver single session Linux desktop. This is interesting, right? Because at first Citrix um, just allowed Linux for the, uh, the, the server version of the Linux multi-session desktop. Now that you can do true VDI with the Linux desktop. Um, thoughts or comments on this one? I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit I think yeah, trying to find a good use case here. And I, I think this is going to come down to, to, to cost, right? So if you're looking at, if you're very cost conscious as a customer uh, per user per month, you know, whether you're on premises or even in the cloud, I, I think it's a great, a great option here. Um, but the interesting thing to me is, is apps, right? So typically if you have web apps, 
very heavily web app focused, that's where, you know, Linux might make sense. You know, you run a Chrome based browser or even Firefox based browser in Linux and you can do your apps that way. It becomes a very affordable way to do, you know, hosted, you know, web apps, so to speak. Uh, on top of a Linux client, the multi-session desktop side, I still got to get my head around that. Maybe you just want to have a dumb desktop for the user that might be doing maybe Zen app, you know, apps within a double hop scenario. I, I don't know, Bill, if what you've seen in your, your travels. I've never run into the multi-session Linux desktops. We, I just had a, we just had a call with a customer last week that was interested in doing single session Linux desktop for Desktop, primarily because there were two tools that they run that are analytics oriented uh, in Linux uh, that they really wanted to make available to a subset of their users. Um, that was the, the use case that, that the apps that they were using or wanted to use weren't available in Windows. Uh, they were only available, believe it or not, in Linux. I think what I found is most of those use cases are driven by um, development, right? And off, offshore development where they're trying to maintain um, some level of security and um, and they've already, you know, they're all super committed to Linux platforms. So I, I, I do yeah, think it's, you guys, it's still pretty niche, you know, for Citrix. Uh, I do think you guys are right, but I think as the world of SaaS based applications where you still need an operating system to some degree, uh, but you're doing SaaS apps that could be 100% access through a Chrome or Chromium browser, um, I think that use case is probably going to grow. We're going to see more of it. Okay, um, next topic here is um, non-domain join, so non-Microsoft Active Directory joined. Um, virtual machines, VDAs, and that one only shows up in option two, which is the Citrix virtual app and desktop standard service. I guess I'm, I guess I'm confused right out of the gate why it's just the one versus all the others. What's unique about it? Yeah, so that that again plays into the whole. They're trying to be a, the optimal control plane for when you know Azure and. Microsoft WBD. Um, so one of the main requirements for WBD right now is you have to have a domain joined uh, virtual machine. So this is kind of like a you know competitive check mark, if you will, of a benefit to using Citrix on top of Azure with WBD. Yeah, I kind of view this as this is really for the it's kind of a niche use case to some degree, but also for the smallest of the small that may not have Active Directory or really just want to use local accounts, that sort of thing for authentication. Um, is where where I would imagine seeing this. Uh, we've had a couple of occasions with really small businesses where we discover they don't have Active Directory. This is really the only thing we can offer them at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are certainly corner cases. And maybe, guys, a lot of times where the customer thinks that not having things domain joined is more secure than having them domain joined, that's always been a, a disputable topic around security, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's get a couple more. I've got one of my favorites down there at the bottom that, um, no, you know what I've got, we got to do. Okay, so let's get through these. Um, ne next one is fast image builder. Guys, I have no idea what that is. Somebody want to chime in on that one? That one, I to, that one I have to do some homework on, but again, this because it's tied to uh, WBD, it's going to, uh, what that is and, and it's kind of hit me now that I'm talking to myself about it is uh, within the, the UI of Citrix, uh, you can now, you can literally point to an image that they maintain and say, Hey, go build this on top of uh, Azure. So they call it fast image build uh, now. Um, so basically they maintain a set of stock images <coughs> as part of the standard service on top of Azure uh, that you can go and say, Hey, here's a windows 10 multi-session image with the VDA built in. I think Chrome is also built in office is built in uh, and you go, boom, you, you go next, 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 ha say add to my domain domain and you're done. So it's basically a standard image that they maintain. Okay. Uh, Citrix prepared images. That looks like it's only available. Yeah. yeah, they go, they go. I think these two go hand in hand um, because, you know, there's prepared images and then fast image build. And, and basically what these essentially does is it allows you to uh, take a stock image, build it on top of Azure or take a stock image and say, Hey, I don't like your minimum spec. So you, your minimum spec might be, four gigabytes, you want to bundle it up and say, Hey, I want to create this same image, but on a 32 gig machine with video support or something, you know, like GPU support. Um, so you can on the fly build your own templates, if you will. 
And Pete, so we got these two plus the next one. Those all seem like um, Citrix managed desktop carryovers. That that's why they end up in number two. Yeah, and that, and like the Citrix managed Azure capacity. That mm-hmm. that's if that's if you don't want to bring anything to the table. So you, you're just say, hey Citrix, I want to pay you for licensing, uh, for the Azure capacity and in the uh, in the Microsoft piece as well, the Microsoft yeah. licensing piece as well. Okay. Well, let, let's hit these next two. I'm going to hit them in reverse order. And these are probably the two most important things to point out uh, as we cover Citrix. And the first is Citrix HDX technologies. That that includes the protocol. That includes uh, local app access. That includes other things that are just core to Citrix. And maybe local app access is a bad example. But really, we're talking about the, um, the amazing user experience Citrix brings to the table. And, and for clarity, that is in all the products, the, the, most, the least expensive as well as the most expensive concurrent user device. It doesn't matter. Uh, the thing that makes Citrix Citrix is the legacy ICA protocol, which has continued to improve over the last uh, 10 years, even though the last 10 years we gave it a, a sexier name like HDX. We could, we could talk about that one for two hours. Guys, you, Bill, you have any quick, quick chime ins on that one? No, you hit most of it. I mean, you know, this is really all around maximizing the the uh, the user experience and making it as as solid as possible. And you know, things like remote uh, screen screen shots and and video and audio, as well as just the standard, you know, mapping local drives, mapping clipboard, all these things that plus many many more that HDX Blade brings to the table. Um, yeah. Really, is all about you know, making the user experience as close to or better than a physical machine. Yeah, it goes back to our podcast last week. This is where Citrix differentiates. And Pete, you're, you're seeing probably this is the main reason why people stub their toe on WBD, I would, I would, I would assume, right? Yeah, and, I, and it's funny. I was prepping for our WBD podcast, and, and you know, there's still a huge gap, not only on the Windows side, but on Mac, uh, iOS, Android, the web side. And so Citrix put a lot of effort behind the protocol and the support across the various clients. Right. Okay, so um, again, we could probably spend an hour on that one. Well, let's give Trevor a quick chance. Trevor, HDX, and in, in your side of the business, what's uh, what's the what's the what's the thing that compels you the most around the Citrix protocol and things that uh, allow your business to be successful with your customers? You know, I think the biggest thing is just the you know you have the biggest toolbox of anybody mm-hmm. else, right? So you don't know you don't know what the future holds for you. You don't know what. Um, for us, it's I don't. We typically customers don't know what the next project's going to be, right? Mm-hmm. And now we've got we as a service provider, we have customers that that multiplies for. But you know, I think the HDX um, you know tool tool bag is you know you're you're not going to get anything bigger, right? Mm-hmm. And and so we can at least we're going into the fight, you know, with the best you know best weapons there so well not, not only that but you've got the biggest best toolbox and you've got what's coming out next which is probably something that you don't know yet that you're going to need that they're already working on because of other customers giving feedback yeah yeah exactly i there's just i i think everybody including myself has underestimated how much has gone into that over the years and what a different you know what a difference maker it is i think there's enough good enough stuff out there like from a protocol perspective but when it gets to actual executing true end user experience i i think that's where you it just separates itself for sure and for an admin i mean it's it's, it's invaluable that, that was my biggest feedback for Citrix after the last synergy is, you know, workspace, great concept, great idea, but you need to keep hammering the fact that you're the best at the basics too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, the next one here, it shows up in number one, number two, and number five and number six. And that is the ability to take that great, amazing HDX technology and take it to the physical world, whether that's blade PCs or cartridge PCs or your existing PC that you can't get to because of some crazy pandemic. Uh, and that's called remote PC access. Um, Bill, any, uh, any light to share on that one specifically? Well, I noticed that uh, that they've included that in what was CMD now. I think that's a tech preview currently. But yeah, this is really uh, allowing you to leverage the same um, the same login and access experience that you would use for a for a hosted or for a shared virtual desktop. Um, 
to access a physical PC sitting in your data center or sitting on your uh, on your desk. I, I had a client a couple of years ago, several years ago, that gave all their users laptops under the hope that they would that would be their you know work from home scenario. And they went around one day and discovered that all the laptops went you know on a weekend were sitting on their desks. Uh, so they went to a remote PC concept where they would actually have to access them remotely and they'd have to be on their desk sitting there. And that was one way of getting forcing the users to leverage that PC for multiple uses. Yeah. I will tell one quick story. I had a company rolling out as a pilot remote PC, and I went back to find out why it had failed. And they were using 10 year old laptops with a bunch of junk where they never bothered to clean up and wondering why it was failing. And that, that, that customer and us didn't go very far. Yeah, sure. Hey Pete, uh, we'll let, we'll let everybody go after this one. Um, Pete, any comments on remote PC and, and where you see the value in that? Uh, I mean, I just see the value is if you're st- you know, you're looking at a, a use case where you're still very static, you know, one-to-one desktop to user and a physical desktop, meaning um, this is a great opportunity if, if you're still forced to be remote workers uh, and they want to get to their, their desktop and get it to get to it reliably. I think it's a great use case. So. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, guys, I'll let you go. We'll do a part two. Trevor, did you have a, one more comment on remote PC? Uh, no, I mean, I, I'm just surprised that it, we don't see more of it. I mean, I, I was I, actually on a call. I see it. I do see it a lot more in finance, right? So invest brokerage houses and stuff like where they have very heavy machines. Um, it's kind of a, it's been a kind of a no brainer for a lot of those guys. So yeah, I, I think people need, I think, I think it's a little education too. So people that um, just don't really, they're not familiar with it. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell one quick story. We had a law, uh, law firm here in Charlotte that rolled out about 500 remote PCs to re- replace their go to my PC. And now they've moved everything to virtual desktops. And that's a great use case and a great story and a, and a way to get the Citrix product in house and then eventually transition into what they really want to do with it. All right, guys. Well, uh, this is part one and we'll wrap it up here and plan to do it again in a couple of weeks. I'll shoot you guys out an invite and we'll, we'll try to cover the rest of these uh, 70 options or features uh, on the next call. Cool, Andy. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you. All right. See you. Thank you for listening to the Citrix Session with your hosts, Andy Whiteside and Bill Sutton. A special thanks to our guest for attending today's podcast. Podcast produced by Pete Downing. For any input or if you'd like to be a part of our podcast, please email us at info at Zentegra.com. Please head over to Zentegra.com forward slash podcast to listen to all podcasts in this series. This podcast is copyrighted by Zentegra LLC. Thank you.